Welcome to Crossroads. We're going to talk about how insider trading in Congress is now being criticized as a form of legalized corruption. Because guess what? Congress members, very much across the board, they're beating the markets, including outdoing even major investment firms. And you know what? It's almost like they can see the future, or maybe more accurately, like the they're altering the future by using legislation to financially benefit themselves. Let's talk about it. Dan Bongino show had this. It said in the least surprising news you'll read all day, a new report confirms that mostly Democrat members of Congress continued to outperform the stock market, a feat that the overwhelming majority of hedge funds failed to do. So what makes members of Congress more able to predict the stock market than even some of the top investors in the entire world, more so than hedge funds for the most part? Well, it says here that over a decade ago, Congress passed the Stock Act as an attempt to crack down on congressional insider trading, which was always a problem, which was notably completely legal before it. One key provision of the act requires members of Congress to disclose any stock trades made by themselves, spouses, or a dependent child, and at least 78 members of Congress have been identified in violation of the act. So they passed this act to make sure members of Congress were not engaging in insider trading and violating our investment laws. 78 members are violating it in the open. So what is the consequence they made for themselves? Well, it says there's not much consequence that they can face really outside of a standard $200 fine. And you do the math. If you're profiting in the millions upon millions of dollars, and you have to pay a $200 fine for that, what are you going to do? Well, look, many of the reports recently were sparked by a report from Unusual Whales, and it showed the public stock trading data of many of these members of Congress. Let's just have a look at it. Unusual Whales, this is the actual report. It says that members of Congress are required to disclose their personal finances through financial disclosure procedures. Financial disclosure forms are filed annually and every time they or their families make a trade. It says these forms are made available to the public through the Office of the Clerk of the House of Representatives and the Office of the Secretary of State, in other words, both branches of Congress. These forms are a key tool for promoting ethical conduct. <laughs> we'll talk more about how ethical it is in Congress and an important part of efforts to promote integrity and transparency in the legislative process, which we will now witness is not looking like it has a lot of integrity or transparency. And notes that this report analyzes data obtained from publicly accessible financial disclosure forms. In other words, you can read it yourselves. This is not secret. It's not a big, you know, conspiracy or anything like that. This is what it says in the publicly available reports. It continues stating Congress beat the market once again. Of 100 trading members of Congress, 33% of them, over one third, beat SYP with their portfolios. How is it that close to one third of the members of Congress who are disclosing their finances are doing better than one of the top investment firms in the world? It notes that Democrats beat their Republican colleagues by a, by a massive margin. Members are once again trading options after not trading them in 2022. It says the overall number of transactions by Congress is down. They are also reducing time to disclosure as well as using the note feature because people now wa are now watching them vigorously. In other words, there are suspicions that because people are paying attention now, they're like, hey, uh, Gee, I wonder if that guy I elected to represent me in Congress to make sure that government is doing what it should is engaged in one of the you know, forms of corruption that would get me thrown in prison. They got Martha Stewart thrown in prison. And you, know, you have to question, why are they trying to hide it from us? And when they disclose it and they're openly violating the law, why is something not being done? Well, let's have a look at the facts. It says there are many unusual trades and conflicts. It says members of Congress sit on important committees, you know, congressional committees where they investigate different things or, you know, play a watchdog role. It turns out many of them appear to be financially benefiting from their roles in these committees. It says congressional committees play a crucial role in the legislative process by conducting in-depth examination of proposed legislation, allowing for expert analysis and debate. 
These specialized committees enable members of Congress to focus on specific policy areas, streamline decision-making, and enhance the efficacy of the legislative branch. Now, see, we, may able, may, we may be able to see interesting trading trends when we chart how committee members traded in different sectors. It shows heat maps on this, and let me just show you some of what's here. It says, some honorable mentions, Dan Crenshaw, the one-eyed guy, who was called out in 2021 in their report, said that stock trading was the only way a congressman could better themselves. Hey, you know what? We're only making, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand a year, and, uh, you know, we just want to make more money. How do we make more money? I can't start a side business. Why don't I do the thing that would get you thrown in prison? because we've passed legislation to allow ourselves to violate the laws you can't, right? It notes that his exact words were that without trading, and I think the keyword here is probably insider trading, he said, you have no way to better yourself as a congressperson. And look, you know, I understand that there are legal and transparent and ethical forms of members of Congress engaging in trading on the stock market. The concern, though, is that because they sit on these legislative committees, because they have oversight, because they can, again, pass legislation themselves, they have insight and foresight, and they can even hold you know, closed-door meetings where they can get information on businesses, including calling the heads of corporations in to testify before Congress. You've had Mark Zuckerberg sitting before Congress. You've had many major business leaders in the United States sitting before Congress. And when they reveal things about what's happening behind closed doors, yes, that would inform you on how to engage in insider trading. That is the big concern and one of the reasons why this is so controversial. And take it a step further. If you're a member of Congress and let's say you're invested in, you know, X company, let's say, let's say you're invested in Tesla, you're invested in a green energy company, electric cars, and you pass legislation to use taxpayer dollars to subsidize electric cars, what's going to happen? The stock that you're heavily invested in is going to skyrocket. You're going to make money off it using taxpayer dollars. And so if you have passed legislation to divert government funding, to give subsidies or whatever else, to something that you yourself will profit from, that raises serious questions of whether you did it because it's the best thing for the country or whether you did it because it's the best thing for yourself. And that's the concern, is that legislation is not being passed free from personal interest, and notably financial interest. And aside from that, even, aside from the area of government corruption, which is what that would qualify as, there's also just the basic issue of insider trading, which again, I, you know, you or I would get thrown in prison for doing this. Martha Stewart! Martha Stewart got thrown in prison for this, and they're doing it openly. Now, it notes that Dan Crenshaw, after saying, you know, you have no other way to benefit, uh, to better yourself, he was the fifth best trader in Congress in 2021 and in 2023 this year. He beat the index with his portfolio up nearly 38%, which was a 15% beat on the index. It's incredible. It's like he can see into the future. Now, it notes that numerous members of Congress traded war stocks, in other words, they're profiting from war, before the Israel-Gaza-Palestine conflict. It notes we, they present the above table, they're showing the document, without comment, noting that SYP is up only 10% since the conflict, the Israel-Gaza war, while members who traded these war stocks have often outperformed. It's almost like they have insights into wars that we're going to get into or wars we're getting pulled into, and they're profiting from getting America pulled into wars, or at least financing them. It notes that we saw something far worse at the start of the Ukraine conflict. You know, Ukraine-Russia, which they documented here. It says Ukraine war report right here. Here's a visual disinformation based on the portfolios for members who, would, who, who most would benefit from war stocks. And notes they added some of this information for reference and so on. And notes that in detail, Kevin Hearn bought RTX Raytheon, a weapons manufacturer, Raytheon being one of the largest you know, arms manufacturers in the U.S. He did that in September, notably before the war started. And it has to make you wonder, well, you know, that's a very smart investment. Interesting timing. 
It's almost like he might have known something was going to happen, and of course that is the concern. Not accusing him of anything, maybe it was totally organic, but again, because of the way this whole system works, it's raising suspicions. People are wondering, hey, uh, are you intentionally getting us pulled into wars so you can get rich? Hey, uh, how far ahead of time did you know this was going to happen? Uh, geez, that's a very smart investment. You seem to be out doing some of the largest stock trading firms in the world. What do you know that they don't? And notes as well that he also bought four energy stocks as well, NEE, XOM, PXD, and DVN. And both have benefited from the ongoing war. They're financially profiting by keeping the war going. And he benefited the most from these holdings as per the graphic included right here. In fact, it says in the past year itself, Kevin Hearn purchased up to $6 million. And he himself sits on the House Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources. Notably raising that concern again is that when members of Congress sit on these committees or subcommittees, they're able to get insider information. Sorry, I'm in New York right now and there's an announcement, so you have to forgive that. Now, it notes here that another example would be Josh Gottheimer himself, Representative Josh Gottheimer, purchased up to $15,000 of Northrop Gunman, which is another major arms manufacturer, and he bought that on September 26. And interestingly, Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, just after that. Now, look, it's hard to say whether they could have had insight that, you know, Hamas was going to launch a terror attack on Israel. There are, of course, many rumors and concerns that maybe some people knew about this ahead of time, right? That's one of the big concerns with it. We don't really know. But we do see that members of Congress were buying stocks in these arms manufacturers that would, of course, be later supplying Israel with arms in the future war ahead of time. Now, again, conspiracy theory, you know, we can't say whether this was known or not, but it's interesting timing and does suggest that, you know, these people just have really interesting insights. And notes as well that he sits on the National Security Agency and Intelligence Committees. And the concern with that, of course, is that if you're on the Intelligence Committee, you might have had background information, intelligence briefings on potential terror threats. And if you know about potential terror threats, hey, Hamas is banging its war drums. Hamas is getting ready for something. Maybe instead of being like, oh, I better tell the public to prepare for a global terror attack, you say, hey, uh, maybe I should buy some stocks in Northrop Grumman in order to you know, personally profit from a future war that might start with this. Now, let's go deeper into this. In particular, let's look at the unusual trades. Nancy Pelosi, who has become one of the big focuses in all this. Nancy Pelosi tops the charts. And a lot of people have been interestingly paying a lot of attention to Nancy Pelosi. There was even a Twitter account, you know, of course, now X, that was based on Nancy Pelosi's stock trades. And <laughs> they, deleted, they deleted it because there were some concerns that if you were trading alongside Nancy Pelosi, that you could be, you could be charged criminally for insider trading. <laughs> there, were, there were people charged and accused of insider trading because they were just doing whatever Nancy Pelosi did. Let that sink in, <laughs> right? If people mimicking the actions of Nancy Pelosi in her stock trades can be accused or charged of insider trading, why is Pelosi not being accused or charged of insider trading? But let's have a look at it. I'm not criticizing, I'm not accusing her of this, but of course there are some, there are some suspicious things going on. Let's put it that way. Now it says on December 22nd, Nancy Pelosi and her husband, the Hammerman, traded Nvidia calls and her Nvidia calls show that Nancy Pelosi once again believes politicians should be able to trade and in large amounts in size. And say let's start in December 2021 after a history of unusual trading. Nancy Pelosi was asked if she thinks U.S. Congress members should trade despite legislative conflicts by Brian Metzger. She said, quote, we are a free market economy. Congress should be able to participate in that. And notes that in January of 2022, Unusual Whales released their most famous trading report showing Congress beat the market yet again. Nancy Pelosi is listed as the fifth best trader in Congress. And that report, it says, creates a flurry of media, created a flurry of media and outrage over this. 
Now, skipping forward in September of 2022, it was revealed that Nancy Pelosi was trading millions, millions of dollars of NVIDIA, which is a semiconductor company. They create graphics cards. And of course, you know, one of the big concerns is that, hey, uh, graphics cards, semiconductors, these are the things that, of course, we're placing sanctions on China over and making it so that China can't buy these and restricting some of the companies on this. And you could expect that if they start restricting international companies, that yes, there'd be a jump in American companies. And it notes that she did this trading millions of dollars, millions, folks, traded millions of dollars in NVIDIA before she voted on a U.S. semiconductor bill by the Biden administration. So imagine, right? You're like, uh-oh, we have to vote for this semiconductor bill that's going to benefit American-based semiconductor companies. And before you go to vote on that as a member of Congress to pass legislation that you know is probably going to benefit a U.S.-based semiconductor company, what do you do? You take millions of dollars and you buy the stocks of a U.S.-based semiconductor company. That raises questions of, did she do this to financially benefit herself? Again, you and I would be criminally charged if we did that. We'd probably get thrown in prison for that. Uh, but Pelosi appears to have done that. It notes that they reported on the trade to once again outrage the public when disclosed. And interestingly, for the first time in history, a few days later, Nancy Pelosi disclosed trades made on the same day that they were made, like the fastest disclosure in U.S. history in Congress. And she reported that she sold out her NVIDIA position. She relinquished it because of the controversy. The first time she divested from conflicts in her portfolio, although notably probably after NVIDIA saw a jump because of the legislation that was passed. It says one month later, Nancy Pelosi proposed alongside Representative Lofgren her own congressional trading ban, a bill which was incredibly weak and filled with loopholes. Like, for example, the one that's already in place, it only charges them $200 if they violate laws that will get us imprisoned. And then what happened? Pelosi stopped trading, interestingly. That is, until December 22nd. One week after Chinese President Xi Jinping visited her home in the state of California and before Joe Biden announced new U.S. semiconductor focuses, what happened? Her husband decided to buy $2 million of deep in the money NVIDIA calls. They just love NVIDIA. The same company she divested from due to conflicts a year earlier. And it says, what's worse, in December 11th, before she bought in November, U.S. Commerce Secretary Raimondo said that NVIDIA, this U.S.-based semiconductor company, could sell slower AI chips to China to comply with U.S. export controls. Maybe that's why she was meeting in her home with Xi Jinping. Maybe that's why, of course, all these discussions were happening with Joe Biden. And the concern is that maybe that's why her husband suddenly decided to buy the very company at the focus of those discussions. And notes that, take it for what it is, just after that, right after, on December 28th, NVDA, NVIDIA's stock uh, trading portfolio, launched a modified version of an advanced chip precisely to get around U.S. restrictions and sell them to China. And notably, of course, right after Pelosi met with Xi Jinping, head of the Chinese Communist Party. And it says that Pelosi has always been quite good at trading before news, but to come back to a company she divested in due to conflicts before excellent news is quite stunning. Now, look, folks, what's the final result of all of this? What ended up happening? Well, the public is becoming aware of this finally. I don't know why it took us so long, right? I know there's been a lot of criticisms around this for a long time. In fact, again, they even had the Stock Act, which was passed many years ago because of this controversy, uh, which only creates a slap on the wrist punishment if members of Congress engage in things that would incriminate us. $200 fine. It notes that, well, you know, many, many members of Congress still are doing better on the stock market than some of the biggest hedge funds in the world. Uh, they somehow are doing this, well, frankly, I'd say, I'd, I wouldn't qualify all of them as, as being the smartest people around, you know what I mean? Some, some, of these, some of these investment guys are smart. I've met some of these uh, hedge fund guys. They're like living calculators. You can give them math equations and they'll spurt them out 
as fast as a, as a handheld calculator could. It's incredible. I doubt many members of Congress have that capability. But for some reason, these individuals are able to outperform those investment firms, which are filled with incredibly intelligent individuals. And again, the concern as well is that, you know, take the Pelosi thing with NVIDIA. Imagine, imagine if you had like a normal guy, right? He's not Nancy Pelosi. Imagine a normal guy, there's a company, right? A company that's trying to, or let's say a country that's trying to get a product from a certain company. The president of that country goes and personally visits somebody who's tied in with it, who has the ability to green light the sale of this product to that country. You're the gatekeeper. You're the one who can make it happen, right? And of course, soon after that, the individual who met personally with the head of that country does in fact take action to pass this law or open the floodgates to allow all of, those, all of that trade to go into that country and benefit them financially. Now the individual knows for a fact that the company that's going to be able to access an entire global market is going to benefit financially. They know that the stock market is going to skyrocket. And then the individual, interestingly, right before that floodgate opens, decides to go and buy tons and tons and tons, millions of dollars in that stock. What do you call that? You call that insider trading. And I'd say even worse than that, when the individual is able, insider trading is when you have awareness that the deal even took place. If, for example, the individuals involved in that deal told friends and the friends bought that stock, they would be criminally charged with insider trading. What this constitutes is not only insider trading, but corruption. If, for example, it raises concerns that the individual passed legislation or opened the floodgates for something while at the same time before they did it, doing, taking actions that would financially benefit from the very deal they're going to pass and they get rich off of it, you call that government corruption. And the concern with these types of actions is that the, these stock act and all these things that allow members of Congress to do this with very little consequence does allow for a certain type of legalized corruption. Would they have allowed that to happen if they wouldn't have, would they wouldn't have financially benefited from it? Would they have passed that legislation if they weren't going to personally profit from it? That's the concern. And unfortunately, you know, we, we can't say what their real intentions were. Maybe they would have passed it anyways. Maybe, maybe that's how they justify it in their minds, right? I was going to do it anyways. I was going to do it anyways. Why not benefit an American company, right? Well, the issue is, of course, the concern over whether that is the case. And one of the reasons why these laws are in place is to make sure that these legislation is not being passed for the purpose of individual gain, that anti-corruption laws are in place for that exact reason, and also to eliminate the problems of insider trading, which are problematic. It's a financial crime, a very serious financial crime. And here you have individuals doing things that, again, we would be arrested for if we did. Now, look, on this, let me show you what Daily Mail had to say. It says, as her fellow Democrats have called for the banning of stock trades by members of Congress, former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi saw a 65% return on her investments in 2023. That's a lot of money. That is a very, like, ridiculously good return on investment. That means you, you know, you ha came close to, you know, 50% doubling your, your investment. If you put $100 in, you made, 50, you made 50 bucks for every 100 you put in, right? More than that, actually. It's, well, 65, right? It says, Pelosi came around on the ban, but initially defended the practice. She's saying, hey, you know, why not? Leading to Senator Josh Howley introducing the preventing elected leaders from owning securities and investments, also called the Pelosi Act, which might have been directed at Nancy Pelosi, and that was in 2023. And notably, that is still not passed. And we can assume that maybe members of Congress, yet again, are deciding to not engage in the legislative process because they're financially benefiting from it. And again, that is the concern of corruption. That they can, when you control the levers of the law, and you're using the law in ways to personally profit and benefit, you're not going to 
turn those levers in a way that might close a loophole that's letting you get rich. That is one of the serious issues with this. And that's the longtime Democrat Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi got a 65% return on her investments in 2023, well over double the S&P 500's overall 24% gain. She more than doubled the gain from S&P 500. How is that even humanly possible without engaging in corruption or insider trading? Right. And notice that that's an even bigger return than in, than in December when DailyMail.com used a tool dedicated to tracking her investment, revealing her, her portfolio returned a remarkable 50 percent in the previous 12 months. And I, again, I'll emphasize that when people caught on to this, you had two reactions. On one side, you had people saying, oh, my gosh, how can our government be so ridiculously openly corrupt? that something like this could happen. And the other side of people said, hey, why don't I just buy the stocks Pelosi buys and get stinking rich because she's better than the S&P 500? Then why, why am I investing in the S&P 500 when Pelosi is doubling their profits? She's, you, you will profit better from just mimicking the investments of her and her husband, right? Now look, Pelosi was pressed on this before, and this was how she and others responded to it. The Hill said this. When asked about a business insider report finding that dozens of lawmakers and staff had violated a law to prevent insider trading, Pelosi last week said they should all abide by disclosure laws, but maintained, quote, we are a free market economy. They should be able to participate in that. The issue is they're violating the laws, not that they should be able to, you know, participate in the market. In response, Representative Ab Abigail Spangberger tweeted, quote, No, I, it cannot be a perk of the job for members of Congress to trade on access to information. Representative Dean Phillips, one of the wealthiest members of Congress, thanks to his business career, it says, that included leading his family's distillery as well as the gelato Brad Talenti, echoed, quote, I disagree with the speaker. He's engaged notably in legitimate business, not insider trading, it seems. And Representative Andy Kim, who represents one of the most competitive districts in the nation, wrote that I disagree strongly with Pelosi's stance. In other words, not all members of Congress are doing this. Many of them have serious objections to it. This is across political aisles. There are Democrats and Republicans involved in this type of activity, and there are Democrats and Republicans very much opposed to this activity. And notably, Andy Kim added, Americans are losing trust in government, and we need to show we serve the people, not our personal slash political self-interests, because that's the concern. Again, how do we trust the government? How do we trust these individuals to make decisions that are beneficial to the people that they are sworn to represent? You know, representative democracy, a.k.a. a republic, is based on the idea that we select individuals to represent us in the democratic process, which is what members of Congress are. Republicans, or sorry, uh, members of the, of course, House of Representatives and Senators. And of course, if it seems that they're not representing us and instead representing themselves, passing legislation to you know, profit and get rich financially, it raises concerns over, well, who are they representing? And are they doing this only because they want to get money or are they doing it because they actually want to represent the American people? Now, interestingly, even Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who has said, it says here, that she does not hold any individual stocks or digital assets, reiterated just recently that she thinks the letting members of Congress trade individual stocks is a bad look. And she said, there is no reason members of Congress should hold and trade individual stocks when we write major policy and have access to sensitive information. And Ocasio-Cortez added, there are many ways members can invest without creating actual or appeared conflict of interest, like thrift saving plans or index funds. Now look, I mentioned before, there are some investors who were like opportunists. They're like, geez, uh, Pelosi's better than the S&P 500. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my money behind Pelosi. If she buys something, I'm buying it. If she sells something, I'm selling it. And people who did that were making a lot of money to the point where some of them were even being, you know, 
accused in some regards of possible <laughs> insider trading because how are you going to do like two to three times better remember like s p 500 is like 23 percent uh you know 23 percent profit pelosi is like over 60 percent how are you going to you know do that without raising some alarms now it's still going on in fact there are trackers online where people are following the investments of pelosi and her husband they're making a lot of money on it but you know this is raising concerns over whether that is legal okay you know again we talked about what insider trading is versus corruption insider trading corruption is when the individual directly engaged with the deal is of course has the authority to pass it and you know open the floodgates and of course before passing it decides to take moves to benefit financially as they do this that's corruption right insider trading is when you make those investments beforehand which would be included within the corruption but could also extend to the people watching it and so again if the neighbors or friends watch this happening and they're like gee uh i better get invested in that because this is my insider source telling me that this deal is about to happen i better buy this stock it's raising concerns over hey uh, nancy pelosi has to publicly disclose her investments right we have insights into it and because a lot of us suspect that hey maybe she has some backroom you know knowledge on this she's engaging possibly in insider trading why don't i do the same thing why don't i also buy that and of course people do it and they they get rich off it interestingly there's there's questions now of well is that insider trading when people are just watching public disclosures of congressional financial reports you know if you're just watching like the public disclosure forms as your as your reference of what to invest in does that constitute insider trading based on your suspicion that these people are corrupt again that's a question we haven't really faced as a society yet that that's actually something we're kind of grappling with right now uh, because it is kind of possible that you could be arrested for doing that uh, again which raises other questions of why are they not being arrested for doing it right but also look how is it that we can have legal exceptions how is it that we can have two sets of laws rules for thee but not for me and of course when they pass legislation on the said punishments when they violate the law and they say you know what i don't believe i should go to prison i believe i should pay a 200 dollars fine maybe a, a glorified parking ticket for my multi-million dollar investment in 65 percent profit margins <laughs> you know 200 dollars that doesn't sound too bad for that well it raises other concerns though that some people are being permitted to violate the law you have a two-tiered justice system and that's of course one of the big discussions we're having as a country right now in other regards there's concerns that there's a two-tiered justice system between republicans and democrats uh, because there's concerns the biden administration is weaponizing the arms of justice against his political enemies there are for example you know trump trump gets arrested for taking home classified documents and we know that bill clinton did the same thing smuggling them out in his socks literally in his socks we know that barack obama did it we know that joe biden did it when he was still a senator so why is he not going to you know be getting arrested just like trump was why is his home in delaware not being raided like trump had mar-a-lago raided why do we have rules being applied in one sense and not in another sense and you know this is one of the i think major issues that has come up that is making people concerned about the integrity of our government and of our legal systems we're wondering whether lady justice is still wearing her blindfold we're wondering is you know is justice actually just anymore and how is it that you can have some people permitted to violate laws remember as well that's one of the arguments right now with presidential immunity you know the supreme court's hearing this case on whether donald trump the former president of the united states and one of the leading political candidates in the country has presidential immunity that would have allowed him to take actions when he was president that you know are now being deemed as crimes taking home you know classified documents uh, of course you know holding protests on january 6th and so on and if trump of course is is not able to have presidential immunity well, what does that mean in other regards? Remember, the argument for that is, you know what? 
if he's guilty, he's guilty. We have to have systems of rules and laws, and it doesn't matter if you're a member of Congress or the President of the United States, the rules apply to you. But we're seeing here a very clear example that no, that's not the case. The rules that apply to you and I, and most people in the country, do not apply to the people in power. They're able to do things we cannot do. They're able to do things that got Martha Stewart thrown in prison. <laughs> you know what I mean? And obviously we do have a two-tiered system of justice that is being allowed to, to, to you know, exist. And of course there are deeper problems as well of whether some of them may pass legislation at a financial interest. That this is not even just an issue that this is beyond the issue of what you know two-tier justice and beyond the issue of insider trading that this could be actual political corruption that government is being co-opted by financial interest that lobbyists and again members of congress holding these committees and ordering people to testify before them heads of major businesses having meetings with international leaders that beneath these meetings, beneath the legislative investigative committees, beneath the laws being passed, legislations, there is something else. That being that they're not just doing it for the good of the nation or based on what's best for the world or based on what's best for their constituents, but instead of best, what's best for them personally. And when they pass something or, you know, make a backroom deal with a business leader or whatever else or pass legislation to subsidize an industry, that they know they can profit from it and make a lot of money on it. That is what corruption is. And again, that's where the concerns of actual legalized corruption are coming in with all of this, uh, coming in notably through a loophole within this system. And there are now members of Congress, again, from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, who are calling these out and criticizing it. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, AOC, Ocasio-Cortez is criticizing it. You know, the figurehead of the Democratic Socialists of America. Even John Fetterman, who has been actually making headlines recently because he's voting very much in line with Republicans suddenly. John Fetterman criticizes back in 2022. Let me show you what he had to say. It says Pennsylvania governor, the Hill said this, John Fetterman, and he's a senator now, by the way, of course. He urged Congress to ban lawmakers, their spouses, and their senior staffers from trading stocks. Because again, it's not just members of Congress, it's the individuals around them, because remember, insider trading is not just the individual, it's the individuals around that person who may be able to get those insights. It's not just members of Congress being able to legally engage in insider trading, it's people around them. Their spouses engaging in insider trading, senior staffers engaging in insider trading, and this little club that is able to violate laws that you and I cannot. Fetterman said that allowing members of Congress and their spouses to trade stocks is a clear conflict of interest. Lawmakers should not be making profits off of the same companies they are supposed to be regulating based on closed door information that is not available to the public. The Hill notes that in a recent poll, 76% of voters expressed support for banning members of Congress from trading individual stocks, including 70% of Democrats, 78% of Republicans, and nearly 80% of independents. In other words, this is bipartisan. The American people don't want this to happen. And so if 70% on the lowest margin of Democrats don't want this, 78% of Republicans don't want this, and 80% of independents don't want this, then why are the representatives representing these voters not taking action to ban it? And again, the concern with that is that the reason they're not listening to their voters, listening to their constituents, 70, 78, 80%, the majority, the reason they're not doing it, the concern is that because they are corrupt, they're getting money from it, and they do not want to take actions that would harm their personal interests. Because as representatives, they are representing these people, and they're not doing it in this case. And it's that lawmakers' stock trades drew unprecedented scrutiny after Senator Richard Burr and others unloaded securities just before the coronavirus pandemic ravaged the market in early 2020. 
And since then, Business Insider identified more than 50 lawmakers who violated congressional stock trading rules by failing to disclose their transactions. And look, we all know what happened during COVID. We all heard the statement, never let a good crisis go to waste. And we now know that many of these members of Congress engaged in stock trading activities before and after that that benefited themselves financially from that crisis. And meanwhile, Texas right now is doubling on, on border security. Another story here I want to talk about briefly. They're talking about border security at the U.S.-Mexico border because guess what has happened? The Biden administration, different topic, they have made it so they can legally dismantle border barriers. Before I jump into that, though, the border issue is still ongoing. Now, look, did you all see in New York just recently that one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city turned into a giant toilet as migrants who were waiting for shelter left, and sorry to be crude, they were leaving cups of human fecal matter on people's doorsteps uh, because presumably they don't like just defecating on the ground. They do it in cups. And for some reason, they're leaving it on people's doorsteps. So what's behind this influx in migrants and why are they doing this in New York? And what are we not being told about it? Well, look, I actually covered a lot of these topics in a feature called Border Deception. And I went to the U.S.-Mexico border. I went to the U.S. side, the Mexico side. And most importantly, I investigated who is behind it. And we exposed the United Nations and U.S. government hand in the whole thing. Let me show you the trailer before I get into more updates on the border. And for those of you on YouTube, notably, don't worry, you won't be jumping from YouTube. But if you want to see my special feature on the border, it's only available on Epic TV. Link to that in the description and live chat. I'll see you after the trailer. What use is a wall if the migrant crisis is being facilitated by the United Nations working with NGOs? Many of the people that can't get visas to come, like, start off in Mexico, they start in South America. Is this a coordinated effort? And if so, what's the motive? Families coming across claiming asylum because they had children, but there was the same children every week. They started testing DNA to make sure that the children were in fact children of the parents. 30% weren't. What's really happening at the U.S.-Mexico border? These are all human smuggling cases from the past couple of weeks. What caused the U.S. policy shift from mass immigration? Now, remember, you can only see that documentary on Epic TV, e -P -O -C -H -TV .com. link in the description. Let's go into what's happening at the border, and we'll go into some questions. All right, brief background. Texas was installing barbed wire border barriers. They were putting uh, things in the water to make it so migrants couldn't swim across and enter the United States illegally. They're getting shipping containers, trying to build walls with that to deter and prevent the unlawful entry into the United States. And Texas also started up a new initiative where, in absence of U.S. government border security, they said, you know what, the government is delinquent on its duties, the federal government, and so the state government needs to fill the, fill the goal, uh, fill the gap. And they made it a crime to illegally enter the state of Texas from another country. They make it so that they can deport these individuals and criminally charge them if they do that. And as part of this initiative, Texas has begun, again, putting in border barriers. Now, the Biden administration sued Texas, the state of Texas. And <clears throat> the Supreme Court just recently heard a case on this. And the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four ruling, in other words, it barely passed, determined that the federal government does, in fact, have the legal ability to cut the barbed wire fences, meaning the Biden administration is now able to go into Texas and remove border barriers to help facilitate the open border policies of the Biden administration. Now, Texas, meanwhile on this, came back right after and said, you know what, we're not going to comply. And Breitbart said this, the Texas military department says it will continue to hold the line in Shelby Park in their efforts to deter and prevent unlawful entry into the state of Texas. 
and under Operation Lone Star orders from the Governor, Governor Greg Abbott, the Texas National Guard's actions continue despite a second demand letter from the Department of Homeland Security to release control of the park seized by the state earlier this month. Now, Greg Abbott is saying, uh, sorry, TDM officials are saying, we remain resolute in our actions to secure our border, preserve the rule of law, and protect the sovereignty of our state. That's in Texas. Now, brief update on that. Uh, of course, the Biden administration is now trying to override Texas refusing to comply with this new order. And because of this, there are Democrats now calling on the Biden administration to activate and take over the Texas National Guard. This is creating a massive constitutional crisis on par with what started the Civil, the civil War, I'd say, uh, because the argument is around state rights. To what extent does the federal government have authority over states? especially in this case different from the civil war when the federal government has become delinquent on a key security issue that is causing the abuse of the american people mass migration people leaving poop and pee cups on people's doorsteps unregulated crime you've, you've had break-ins and murders and high-speed car chases americans are dying in 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 the numbers of a major war from fentanyl you're looking at like 70,000 or more deaths a year from you know, drugs and overdoses, all of which is being facilitated through the open border policies. And as Americans are dying in war numbers, as Americans are unable to afford houses because there's more competition for housing, as we're having to subsidize free homes and free cars and free health care and free everything else for people violating American law. And as the federal government is working hand in glove with the United Nations to facilitate this, there are issues now of whether the federal government, one, is you know, in cahoots with it, why they're doing it is one of the big questions still, but also the fact that while they're delinquent in their duties, they're not only doing that, but preventing a state from trying to protect its borders. And this, currently as it stands, is the constitutional crisis we're in at the moment. Uh, the way this turns out is still going to be unknown, but this is, this is a serious issue. Uh, we'll see how this goes, especially notably as the U.S. is getting pulled into possible wars against terror groups. Uh, Biden has made some war declaration acts on the sidelines with the Houthi rebels uh, backed by Iran, and there are concerns of you know, terrorists flooding the U.S. border and illegally entering the U.S. And again, the open border policies are facilitating that. All right, folks, that's sad. Let's jump into some questions. Let's see here. Um, Ron, you're saying, isn't this the kind, one isn't this the kind of stuff the Roman Republic was accused of in its decline? <laughs> yeah, actually across the board. Uh, the Roman Republic had transsexualism. The Roman Republic had, of course, border security issues with, you know, the Roman, uh, the Germanic tribes, those, those barbaric Germans. Uh, they had issues with that. Uh, the Romans had issues of, of course, you know, just rampant corruption, the corruption of the Senate, especially during the, during the Roman Republic era. And, you know, personally, I'd say America, in terms of politics, in terms of the, the problems of upper-tiered corruption versus the interests of the average citizen, and in terms of the other problems we're facing, we're, we're at a very similar juncture right now as the Roman Civil War with the rise of Julius Caesar and the crossing of the Rubicon and the overthrowing of the Roman Republic and the ushering in of the you know, Roman Empire. That the, the, you know, the Senate came to a rel relatively came to an end. Uh, America, if you were to compare you know, the situations, we're, we're at a very similar juncture as Rome during this during its civil war, um, it's, it's fascinating stuff actually. If you want to read some great books in that, by the way, I recommend *Pharsalia* by Lucan, one of my favorite books. It's a poetic a poetic writing of the Roman civil war. Um, it's on par, I'd say, with the Iliad or the Aeneid. Uh, it's a fantastic and relatively forgotten book written by Lucan about, I believe, like a hundred year, hundred BC, roughly. It's it's very good. Um, also, uh, you can read, of course, Caesar's writings on the Civil War, which are just titled Civil War. 
Uh, Miss Terry, yes, you're saying, what the heck is going on in NYC? I, I have to wonder myself, Miss Terry. <laughs> I, I don't think our elected officials even know what's going on in NYC. Um, I, I, I think, I think we, we've lost intelligence. We've lost intelligence. There's, there's no more intelligence, uh, there's no more intelligence analysis. New York City has lost all intelligence and we're spiraling out of control, careening through space without any clear direction. Um, <laughs> the city's falling apart, basically. Uh, because of the mass migration issue, and of course New York law, which forces the governor, uh, forces the mayor to you know give free housing to every single person if they can't afford it, uh, is causing the city to become bankrupt. And as the city is becoming bankrupt, they're asking the federal government for money. You know, it's 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 like, do you know how you catch a monkey or you catch a raccoon? It's very similar, actually. It's so. It's kind of so messed up that it's it's debatably ethical. Uh, you ever read the book? Um, what was it? Where the red fern grows as a kid, where the kid has these hound dogs and he's hunting raccoons, and you know he he finds a trick where you can catch a raccoon. And what you do is you get a box that's big enough for the raccoon to stick its hand into, and you put a little shiny object on the other side of it. And when the raccoon opens its hand and grabs the object, it finds that it cannot pull its hand out. And that tiny furry creature uh, will not, including in the face of death, just let go of that thing and pull its hand out. And so there are hunters who, you know, go and catch them and club them and, you know, get their furs using that method. And a lot, a lot of hunters have moral issues with that. Same thing with monkeys. You can put a banana in a box and the monkey will not let go of that dang banana. And I'd say the Biden administration with, you know, open borders and all these crazy laws that are bankrupting all the Democrat sanctuary cities. They just won't let go of that dang banana. They, they just want that banana. And, uh, you know, as, as reality is, is lurking through the hills coming towards them, they just won't let it go. They're not letting it go. And look, we talked about what's happening with Texas and Texas saying, I, I'm not going to comply. Come and take it. Come, come and cut my barbed wire fence and see what happens. This is Texas. You know, that, that's essentially what they're saying to the Biden administration. Uh, they're calling them out. If Biden mobilizes the Texas National Guard and undermines Texas, like, state sovereignty, this is going to be a constitutional crisis during an election season where it looks like Biden is walking in the, in the footsteps of, like, you know, uh, Mussolini or something like that. It's going to look so bad for him that it would be politically devastating. And um, regardless of what happens, if other states follow in the footsteps of Texas and say, hey, we're going to secure our borders too because it's bankrupting us and there's nothing we can do about it. And this, even as even Democrat states notably are, you know, calling for more border security because they can't afford the crisis that's been forced upon them. Um, we're heading into really something pretty dang serious and it's going to create a crisis for joe biden as we enter the 2024 elections this is this is overshadowing all the trump charges and 14th amendment argument and all that other stuff people care a lot about this including in very liberal neighborhoods because in in new york where they have the issue of the migrants leaving poop and pee cups on people's doorsteps that's like one of the most leftist strongholds in Manhattan. That's like one of the strongholds of like the Democrat voting base where illegal aliens are leaving poop cups on their doorsteps. How do you think they're going to vote if, if that's happening, right? This, this is the problem they're facing. Bidenomics 2024 boycott, you're saying, have you considered the massive immigration to be part of a soft coup suggested by Dr. Moss, like Netflix, leave the world behind? Should Biden fail to succeed this November, do you think they can take us out street by street like, like in Israel once this networks, the networks are blocked? Um, without a doubt, I do believe we're having two or several crises take place with mass illegal immigration. One of them is that the illegal aliens coming here, uh, they're indebted to human traffickers. They owe, they owe money to them. And there's different types of human traffickers. I, I had an interesting conversation with some folks on this recently. If you get trafficked by the Russian mafia, 
you know, you might have to pay off your debt. If you're a woman, you might have to engage in prostitution for a while until your debt is repaid. After it's repaid, you're scot-free. You can go. If you get trafficked by the snakeheads under the Chinese mafia, you're a slave for life. You have to work in a Chinese restaurant. You have to work in a prostitution house. You have to work in a garment factory. Even if you flee, you come to the U.S., you're a slave for life. The Mexican cartels and the human traffickers of the border, they're kind of in between. I've heard mixed things about them. Uh, but what is happening right now is that the illegal aliens owe huge debts to these people. They have to give them monthly payments. And if they do not make those monthly payments, these human traffickers in Mexico, uh, the ones ironically you know, be financially benefiting from Joe Biden and the Democrats and the United Nations, these human traffickers will kill the family members of the illegal aliens here. And remember, because they're the ones running the Disney lines, you know, to get across the border, they even give wristbands. And the wristbands will even state which cartel is facilitating it. It's, it's insane. Um, I, I, I've personally seen these wristbands cut at the border when I was uh, investigating it. Um, they, again, these people are indebted to them and they have to pay monthly payments. And so you've had issues of illegal aliens going door to door begging for money. You've had issues of illegal aliens engaging in crime. And remember, one of the problems they have is they cannot legally work. Um, you know, it's hard for them to get jobs and there's, there's a lot of competition for it. And so in order to get jobs, they have to steal somebody's identity. Uh, they do identity theft and, of course, get social security numbers and do that. And that's raising questions of their own. A lot of them are not working at all. And again, as that happens, they have to make money. So what are they doing? Well, look, if you're indebted to the cartel, a drug trafficking and human trafficking and murder for hire organization, and you're like, hey, I need money, and they say, hey, I got a way for you to make money. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to have organized crime in the United States skyrocket to levels unimaginable. Levels we could have never possibly thought of before. Uh, because you're not talking anymore about, you know, let's say Italian immigrants coming here and having to protect their communities and get protection money, right? Like the mafia. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people every single month illegally entering, most of whom will be indebted to some form of human trafficker. And maybe not all of them will have to deal with this type of thing, but I guarantee you're going to watch prostitution skyrocket in the United States. In fact, I've witnessed it in New York. Uh, there are women openly soliciting themselves on the streets now. If don't believe me, go to Jackson Heights in Queens and you can see it personally. I've seen gangs charging people for subway swipes where if you want to use the subway toll, you have to pay the gang money and they swipe you through. Uh, I've seen personally, we have open robberies here constantly. You've had gangs doing just smash and grab operations against brick and mortar stores. The drug trade is going to skyrocket. And I'll tell you my big concern is that most of this crime is limited within these communities currently very soon it's going to start spilling over. And I, I would imagine you're going to start seeing a lot of human trafficking. You're going to start seeing a lot of kidnappings, a lot of sex trafficking. You're going to start seeing fentanyl deaths skyrocket, drug use. The drug markets are going to become extremely lucrative because you have a lot of people who don't have to work and they have a lot of free time and they need something to do in that free time. Uh, I guarantee you we're going to see rule of law take a nosedive in this country. And as that happens, um, I, I believe we're going to see spillover of those abuses and then probably a lot of violence. Now, the other question is, well, what about terrorism? Uh, there are terrorist groups openly infiltrating the U.S.-Mexico border. In fact, Hezbollah has a very heavy presence in Latin America, as does Iran. And we've already seen cases where individuals crossing are known and very prolific terrorists who have included who have even spent time in prison there have been videos of some of these individuals um, we're going to start watching the possibility of fifth column terror attacks in the united states where sleeper cells hezbollah maybe other groups are activated and begin carrying out terror attacks i guarantee you this is going to become a real serious problem for us very soon uh, especially as the war in the middle east Israel, Hamas, 
uh, Iran getting pulled in, uh, pulling itself into this now, and the possibility of that whole thing blowing up, <laughs> pun not intended, um, it's going to get it's going to get bad. I'm just being honest with you all. And um, also, there's just the issue as well of you know possible uh, color revolution. Remember, one of the big things also being done right now. NBC News had a story on it. The left is preparing for the possibility of return of Donald J. Trump. And one of their concerns is that when Trump comes back into office, he's going to institute martial law. Part of that will be to facilitate the mass deportation of every single illegal alien in this country. He's saying he's going to, on day one, do this. Now, to do that, he's going to have to declare martial law, very likely, and then start a mass deportation operation using the U.S. military. The other concern is that as part of that act of martial law, and I'm not saying this on some like conspiracy theory thing, you, you can go to New York Times and stuff and see them concerned about this, uh, is that they also are talking about using the court, the military court system to do anti-corruption purges in the U.S., go after corrupt officials and other individuals. Now, the powers that be are worried about that and very likely trying to save their own heads from the guillotine uh, they are trying to take action right now to pass legislation that would forbid the President of the United States from activating the military in the case of an insurrection. Because the President can declare an insurrection. We're, we're under attack from forces within. We need to activate the military to put down this threat. They're trying right now to make it so the President cannot do that. And imagine what that could mean in the future. You could have an actual insurrection take place, launched by one political party. And unless you can get both branches of Congress to take action to pass legislation to grant the president the right to mobilize the military, well, nothing's going to be done. And so that will open the doors to what I would believe would be a coup d'etat, that you could have an actual color revolution that the president would not be able to do anything about to stop. And that's where we are right now with this. Um, personally, I, I don't think it's going to get that bad. Trump has an interesting way of pulling, uh, pulling some good old-fashioned judo on these folks. I don't know how he does it, but uh, I, think, I, I don't think it's going to be possible for them to, to do what they're planning on doing, frankly. And I think more, more likely than not, the crazy policies and crazy actions taking place will very likely have an opposite effect. I, I think already we're watching that the craziness of the things we're witnessing are causing people to ironically turn against them. People are witnessing what these policies lead to. And they're going to be voting the other way around uh, come 2024, which, which is an interesting state to be in. All right, folks, thank you so much for being here. Uh, real quick as well, check out the special feature I did, Border Deception, where I went to Mexico, I went to the U.S. side, the US side of the Mexico border, and I investigated who is really behind the border crisis. An important feature. All right, folks, link in the description below and in the description. Thank you so much for being here, and as always, I will see you tomorrow. Please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.